Wines have acidity. Even red wines have acidity to them, but tannins calm it down. In a white wine, when the acid is high, you take a sip and your tongue starts to salivate, kind of like if you suck on a lemon, it makes you crave another drink. Just as you squeeze lemon on a fish because it adds that mouthwatering acidity and makes the food taste better, I think the acidity also brings forward the flavor in the wine and makes it even taste better. Acid is our friend. <laughs> yes, there's a balance. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week, I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 182. Are you curious about why Cabernet Franc should have just as much respect from you as a wine lover, if not more, than Cabernet Sauvignon? What makes wines from California's Paso Robles region unique? And why is it easy to fall in love with wines that have high acidity? You'll hear those stories and more in part two of our chat with Lori Budd, who hosts the podcast Exploring the Glass. You don't need to have listened to part one from last week first, but I hope you'll go back if you missed it after you finish this one. Now, on a personal note, before we dive into the show with the continuing story of publishing my new wine memoir, Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Depression, and Drinking Too Much. So, I received my first in-depth analysis from my editor at my publisher, Dunder and Press. I was pretty nervous about what he'd say because of his background, which is actually why I wanted to work with him. His name is Russell Smith, and he was a columnist for the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper, for 20 years covering arts and culture. He also hosted the popular CBC radio program, that's our NPR or BBC, about language called And Sometimes Why. He has taught creative writing for the Masters of Fine Arts degree programs at the University of Guelph and the University of Toronto and published eight books, several of which were nominated for the coveted Giller Prize and the Governor General's Award, among others. So those awesome credentials made me choose him over another publisher. But those awesome credentials are terrifying when it comes to anticipating his feedback on my book, baby. So I'll share with you the letter from him that accompanied the draft. Hi, Natalie. Attached, find the annotated manuscript with some suggestions for small changes. I really enjoyed reading it, and I'm not suggesting any major restructuring. You'll see that I am frequently suggesting small cuts to keep it focused and to avoid repetition. I was reminded when reading it of what is so powerful in this story, the section that describes the sexist attacks on you and the childishness of your opponents is jaw-dropping. I feel genuine indignation turning to anger when I read what you went through. I think it is an important thing that you are doing to expose the illness in this culture and the sheer cruelty of the online attacks. Then he added suggestions for clarifying some of the people in the book. I won't go into that here because without context, it won't make sense. He also had some great tips on how the witchy references should or shouldn't be integrated. And he wrapped up by writing, the ending is great. Woof. (laughs) What smokes? What a relief. I am so motivated now to continue refining the book for my next deadline. I don't know why my mind always goes to the worst possible scenario. I'm sorry, we have to cancel our contract with you (laughs) and other things. But there you have it. Have you ever anticipated the worst? Almost worked yourself into knots and then pleasantly discovered that it's going to be okay, relax? (laughs) Let me know. As promised, I'll share one beta reader review with you now, and this one is from Merle Rodway in Mount Pearl, Newfoundland. As I read, I felt I was actually living with the narrator or in her shoes. 
This is an intriguing story that keeps the reader engaged and on the edge. Her ability to put thoughts down on paper seems effortless, but I know from what I read she must have gone through hell at the time, but found the vines to help her recover. Five stars. Thank you, Merle. I've posted a link to a blog post called Diary of a Book Launch in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 182. And this is where I share more behind the scenes stories about the journey of taking this memoir from idea to publication. If you want a more intimate insider seat beside me on this journey, please let me know that you'd like to become a beta reader and get a sneak peek at the manuscript. Email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. Okay, on with the show. Okay, so how does this work? You have the label Dracaena Wines. Do you have a winery building or are you using a crush pad, like a virtual winery right now to make your wine? So we are what is considered an AP, an alternating proprietorship, which is a brilliant concept and it's done strictly so that the government gets their money. Basically what happens is it's one winery and I think there might be 30 wineries that hold their O2 license in that place. And when it comes time to process the wine, they literally sign paperwork over to us. So we own the winery at that time. We process our fruit. We sign the winery back over to them. And then the next people come in and they own the winery. So what it is, is it allows us to have access to all of the stuff, the equipment you need for a winery. But I don't have to pay for all of that equipment because I can't afford all of that equipment. It's very capital intensive. It's a massive investment. I mean, that's why there are more and more virtual wineries, but this AP sounds interesting as well. It sounds like a relay team, like, okay, now your turn. Right, right. And the difference kind of is like when at a crush facility, usually somebody else is making your wine, right? Where at this AP, it's our winery. It's our wine. We're making the wine. There is a winemaker there if you want somebody to make your wine, but we hold our own license at this winery. We're at a crush pad, at a crush facility. It's their license, and you're making wine under their license. At this, we're making wine under our own license. Got it. And so how many cases roughly do you produce a year? We are tiny. We are just under about 400 cases. Oh, very boutique. Yes. Yes. And that's big. Our first vintage was 75 cases. <laughs> oh, you're growing. That's good. Yeah. And why the name Dracaena? What does that mean? So I will show you. So this guy here is Draco and he was our Weimaraner for 14 amazing years. And he was named after the constellation of dragons. Okay. So for people who are listening and can't see that, it's a dog. It is a Weimaraner. Yep. Okay, there you go. He was named after the constellation of dragons. He was actually pre-Harry Potter. So <laughs> when he passed at 14, we put a Draco tree in his spot. I'll show you on the reserve because it's probably easier to see. You can see the tree that he stands in front of. Yeah. So that is a Dracaena Draco tree. And it is a cool tree. It's very gnarly and it's out there. It's originally from the Canary Islands. But it's called a dragon tree. It all plays into Draco. It's a dragon tree. And if you puncture it, the sap is blood red. And it's called dragon's blood. And it's supposed to have mystical powers. In the Wiccan world, it's got powers and healing. You know, so it all ties into the Draco. So being the science dorks that we are, Dracaena is actually the genus name for a Draco tree. So Dracaena Draco is the... Latin name for the tree. So that's where the name comes from. Yeah, you were pre-runner, not only to Harry Potter, but Game of Thrones. You've got the dragons and there's the red tree that blooms red in the middle of the winter. It's Wow, you are really prescient with your naming. Yeah. And that's so funny that you bring up Game of Thrones because people have such a difficult time saying Dracaena. That a lot of them say Draciana or whatever. And I just, it's Latin, it's Dracaena. And we even have the pronunciation, the phonetics on the back label. But when Game of Thrones was popular, people were like, oh, you're the Dracaris wine. And I'm like, you can say Dracaris, but you can't say Dracaena. But, I went, <laughs> you know, Game of Thrones was not. <laughs> so, yes, it's all dragon related. It's all for our Weimaraner Draco. <laughs> 
That is wonderful. And so you decided to make wine in Paso Robles from Paso Robles fruit. Why Paso Robles and not, say, Napa or another Santa Barbara or somewhere else? The people make Paso Robles. I don't think there is another place on earth that is like Paso. They are true believers of rising tide raises all ships or however that quote is. We visited Paso because when we were talking about retiring, we were really young, but we wanted to retire. I went to college in Southern California and I love Southern California. And then Mike, we had visited the wineries in Napa, Sonoma. So Mike wanted Northern California and I didn't want that. So one trip for a vacation, we're like, you know, let's try this central coast thing. And we didn't know about it. We didn't know about Paso. Back then, I think there was probably less than 100 wineries there. And we visited and we were like, oh my gosh, there's wine here too. So we started tasting the wines. We started talking to the people and it was love at first sight. And we're like, this is where we are going to live. This is where we will retire to. This is where this winery is going to be. It's a beautiful area. The people are incredible. Everybody helps everybody there. You've got downtown now that is just exploding It's just a wonderful place. And the fruit is amazing because of that diurnal shift we have. It's incredible. The daytime to nighttime change in temperature. So the nighttime cools down and preserves the freshness, the fruit, the acidity, whereas the daytime is warm enough to ripen the fruit. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, we may get to 105 degrees during the day, but at three o'clock, almost consistently three o'clock, the wind starts to come in. The vines start to blow, you know, the leaves start to blow and then everything cools down and it can be like 105 in the day and 50, 60 at night. So huge, huge diurnal shift. So it allows the fruit to stay on the vines as long as we need them to stay on to ripen. But like you said, preserve everything. Yeah, exactly. And what does Paso Robles look like, like for, to visit the region? What is the geography, the terrain? Oh, incredible. There's so much variation. East side versus west side. East side is kind of gentle slopes, rolling hills, mountainous on the west side. Like, you know, you can have mountains, beautiful mountains on the west side. Temperature variation is different. Rain variation is different. Much more coastal influence on the west side than the east side. Although there's like some dips in Templeton Gap comes in and that's a whole other ball game. What is the Templeton Gap? So it's one of our AVAs, but it's this gap that comes in. And because of how the ocean influence comes in, it just kind of comes in and keeps this one AVA very cool. What is it? American Viticultural Appalachian. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Like All a right. DOC. Okay. Yes. Yes. So we have Paso Robles. And then we have these sub-AVAs. We have 11 sub-AVAs. Oh, within Paso Robles. Okay. Within Paso Robles, right. And how big is Paso Robles in terms of production versus, say, Napa? Like, roughly. I know. Okay. Yeah, I don't have exact numbers. We just reached about 300 wineries. Okay. So we're much smaller than Napa and Sonoma. Like, what we consider a large winery is 6,000, 7,000 cases. So pretty small. Yeah. You know, there's the few 10,000s. You know, we don't have those massive wineries that Napa Sonoma has. Okay, cool. Was there anything that surprised you when you started into this business, like into the business of making and selling wine? So the good surprise is being from Jersey, we don't trust people very easily. (laughs) East Coasters, we're kind of, you know, everybody's looking out for something. And the thing that surprised us most and why we love Paso so much is how open everybody is. Like we source our fruit. We don't want to be farmers. We want to be excellent winemakers. We'll let the farmers be excellent farmers. And there's no written contracts. It's a handshake. And that blew our mind. We were like, uh, I don't know. I think we need a contract here, you know, but it's a handshake. And it's the best relationships ever. Like we don't have any issues with these farmers. They're fantastic. So that's Paso. So that was good. The other good shock was when we first got into it, we were sourcing fruit from this vineyard and we went to another winery that sources fruit from the vineyard and we wanted to taste their Cab Franc to see what it was like. And 
we went in and we tasted and we started talking. And in Paso, for the majority of the time, most of the places you're talking to the owners, you're talking to the winemakers. So it was the wife was behind the counter. And when we told her that we were tasting the Cab Franc because we were just getting into the industry, she's like, hold on. And she gets on the phone and she calls her husband, who was out in the field working, and he leaves work, comes in and spent two hours with us telling us what to look for, what to do, what not to do, how to make the fruit the best the fruit you can get on that vineyard site. And like, like we were blown away. Like, you know, he left working <laughs> to tell us about this. It's the pass it on. When people ask us questions, it's the same thing. And that was a positive shock of the world. And wine sharing world. trade secrets, if you will. Yeah, that was a positive shock. The negative shock was all of the decisions that you never think you have to do. You know, like choosing this bottle, choosing this bottle, our entire dining room table had samples of bottles on it. And you're looking, okay, what's the shoulder like? How long is the neck? How big is the punt? How fat is this? Is it a male bottle? Is it a female bottle? You know, what do you like? What makes a male bottle versus a female bottle? The shoulder size. Oh, oh, you're talking about the slope for Burgundy? Yes, yes. Okay, versus the rounded shoulders of a Bordeaux bottle. Yeah, right, okay. right. So the bigger the shoulders, the more masculine the bottle, you know, things oh, like wow. that. Okay. You know, okay, the label. Oh my God, the back color of the label, how big the label should be, what the font is. So many tiny, tiny decisions that matter so much because research shows you have eight seconds to catch somebody's eye on a label if they don't know who you are. So that was a negative shock. And just well, before you leave that, did the research show that brighter or whiter, lighter labels are perceived as more expensive bottles of wine? I've read that somewhere before. More white space, people perceive more white it as space, yes. upscale. Yeah. Yes. More white space is more upscale. You know, I think that goes to the chateaus. American labels have colors all over like the castles and all of that stuff. Right. right. And did the research reveal anything else surprising about label design? Not about label design, but another research one that was interesting is they took wine drinkers, actual people who drink wine, no wine, and they put them in a blind tasting and they took a bottle and they opened it, cork, they made that cork sound and they poured the wine in and the people tasted it and they rated it. And then they took a wine and they unscrewed it and tasted it. So it was blind. All the people could do was hear the pop or hear the crack. And the cork bottle won outrageously better wine. And it was the same exact wine. All they did was oh. fake the screw cap. Oh. They... <laughs> oh, no. When was this done? Um, I would say that was about seven, eight years ago. Screw caps have come a long way since then. But what that shows me is what the brain does. You know, your brain is an amazing thing and it can make you have an opinion without you even really realizing you have an opinion. Very much so. Wow. Huh. All right. In retrospect, is there anything you would have done differently in terms of starting the winery? I love our wine. I love how we've done everything. I like that we started small and we're not trying to be too big, too fast. Getting 90 plus ratings every vintage. Wow. So major magazines, I presume. From wine enthusiast. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We've won multiple double gold medals. We've won best of shows. So I guess we're doing something right. If there was a wish, the wish is that I didn't have to have a full-time job to support the winery for all of this time so that I could have been doing this 100% and we could have a tasting room now. But, you know, reality, you need money to pay for it. So I'm happy with where we are and what we do. I just, I want to be more into it. You know, I wish we had a tasting room. I wish we had that type of thing. Well, sounds like you're going to get your chance to be more into it as of March 1st. Yes. So that's going to be exciting. My gosh, that's so close. Now, you and your husband have a special fondness for Cabernet Franc, one of the five major grapes of Bordeaux, the others being, of course, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec, and Petit Verdot. Why the fondness for Cabernet Franc? <laughs> So actually, that is because of a Napa winery, William Harrison. We were visiting one time and we walked into the winery and the person behind the counter said that they just had a club member come taste. So they had this extra bottle and would you like to taste it? And 
Like seriously, whoever says no to tasting an extra bottle. And so she poured it for us and we both fell in love with it. We were like, this is the best wine we've had all week. What is it? And they said Cabernet Franc. And we were like, oh, don't know Cab Franc. So again, being science people that we are, we purchased the wine and then went on a research mission and found out about Cab Franc and found out its history and what it's like, and then went on a mission to find Cab Franc. And there wasn't a lot out there. It just wasn't there. So when we decided to start the winery, we're small and there's business sense and then there's heart sense, you know, and this kind of came together because as a small winery who's just starting, you need to find your own little niche, right? You can't be the little fish in the big pond. So, you know, for us to try to compete with Zinfandel in Paso, you know, we're not going to compete with those wineries, the Tobin James that literally has the largest wine club membership in the world, based on Zinfandel, or the Jay Ducey's that the family were the first families to bring wine, you know, grape vineyards to Paso, and it was Zinfandel. You have to find your own little niche. So we're like, you know what? We also don't know if anybody's going to drink our wine. So if we're going to make wine, it better be something that we like. So we sought out Cabernet Franc, and that's our passion. We love it, and we promote Cab Franc. Not sure it's the best thing for the winery, but we promote any winery that does Cab Franc. I started Cab Franc Day to promote yeah, it as a, why. Yeah, okay. <laughs> to, to promote the undervalued More or More than a blending grape, yep. More the than under- a blending grape. That sounds like a song from Journey or, or some band. <laughs> more than a feeling. That's yes, what I'm thinking more than of. Feel, right. Anyway, more than a blending grape. So you started this to get more recognition for it as a grape. As a grape. And again, being Jersey and having that Jersey attitude, there is Cab Sauv Day. There's Merlot Week, uh, month. I'm sorry. There's Merlot Day, Merlot Month. There's Sauvignon Blanc Day, which is the other parent of Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, Cab Franc and Sauvignon Blanc come, came together for Cabernet had Sauvignon. Had a wild night or whatever it is you say. <laughs> yes, that's what <laughs> I say. Produced Cab Sauv. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they funny. had a wild and crazy night together. And all of these wine holidays, and there wasn't one for Cab Franc that is responsible for Merlot, responsible for Carmenere, responsible for Cot, which is Malbec. All of these relations, we have all of these other grapes because of Cab Franc, and nobody cares about Cab Franc. So in 2015, when we were going to be releasing our first vintage, I created Cab Franc Day, and I did it completely just on social media, just started sending out, let's celebrate the grape, let's do this, and it ranked second on Twitter. Really? Yeah. And today it is internationally recognized. It is on every wine holiday. All of the major people know it, all of it. So this is fantastic. And more wineries are now producing a Cab Franc. And I like to think I have a little part of that reason why they do that. You do. So you decided on December 4th for the day. Why is that? (laughs) Because I hate holidays that rotate. Oh, okay. Change dates like Easter changes dates every year. Right. It's the third Thursday of the summer or it's the fourth Friday of this. I hate those days because nobody ever remembers when it is, right? It's true. It's true. So I wanted a very specific day. I just figured you can't just pick a day out of a hat. There has to be a reason for it. So December 4th is actually the anniversary of the death of Cardinal Richelieu. And he is really the father of Cab Franc. Who is he now? Depending on how you look at him, he either was a very good guy or a very bad guy in history. Most people lean towards the bad guy. If you watch The Three Musketeers, he's in there. He's the bad guy in there. He's a clergyman, right? Yes, with very high aspirations for himself. But he enjoyed Cab Franc, and he brought Cab Franc cuttings from Bordeaux to the Loire Valley where they flourished, which is where they really you know, that's the true home. Yes, it's Bordeaux and they make these blends with Cab Franc, but it's a minimal portion of Bordeaux blends. In the Loire Valley, it is Cab Franc. It leads. So that would have been in the 1600s or so because he died in 1642? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Well, no, I did a little research, but I want you to (laughs) fill in the gap. So, but it's his death that you're celebrating, right? Well, not celebrating his death. Yeah. It's the anniversary. Anniversary. Paying homage to what he did for Cab Franc. Yes. Yes. The good part of his life history. So what kind of reaction has there been to Cab Franc Day? I mean, more and more participating. Do people do anything unusual aside from opening and drinking Cab Franc? A lot of wineries celebrate by doing offers or free tastings 
or things like that. Through exploring the wine glass, I run a social media promotion every year where I organize for wineries that are interested. I send out samples. I arrange for the samples to be sent to wine writers so that they can write articles about the wines. My usually like the whole month of November into December 4th, my Exploring the Wine Glass page is filled with the wineries that are part of the promotion. And my husband and I got to travel to Hungary, to Villene, to talk about Cab Franc Day because Villene is their Cab Franc or Cab Franc is what they rest their claim on. So yeah, it was wonderful. It was a Franc and Franc symposium. It was an incredible experience. Yes. Talking frankly. Yes. <laughs> in Canada here, Cab Franc is one of our leading reds. Uh, we have a cool climate, as you know. So I was curious when you said Cab Franc and Paso Robles, because I think of Paso Robles as a very warm climate. How do you grow and be successful with Cab Franc in Paso? So for those who don't know, Cab Franc and Cab Sauv, they have this compound in them called pyrazine. And these pyrazines are what gives that bell pepper. And so in a cool climate, Cab Franc, you're going to get a lot more of that bell pepper. Or green pepper. Green some pepper. Call it, right. But yeah. Green pepper, right. Vegetal, yeah. And that's because these pyrazines get broken down by sun. So in the cooler climates, there's not enough sun. Some regions have much more difficulty allowing the Cab Franc vines to ripen fully. So you're going to get more of that vegetativeness in there. In a warmer climate, that vegetative aromas and taste kind of burn off. So in Paso, it's a very different Cab Franc. There is bell pepper or green pepper in here because Cab Franc has that. It's just part of its DNA. But we actually not fans of the green pepper, the bell pepper. So the vineyards we chose were very specifically farm to burn off that pyrazine. So we are not an in-your-face green or bell pepper Cab Franc. Right, right. Yeah. And when you say it has it in it, bell pepper, again, no one's adding bell pepper, but it has a molecular structure that will mimic what a bell or green pepper smells like. So you're getting that at the molecular level. So for a warmer climate, that's great that it gets rid of the pyrazines, but what about the risk of over-ripening or burning the fruit? So one of the things we love about our vineyard site is how it's designed. Joe Plummer, who is our vineyard owner and manager, he is an engineer before he went into farming. So again, science geeks unite. Yes, you found each other. <laughs> yes. And the way the vines are aligned, they're eight degrees off what would be a dead center to the sun. And so as the sun comes over our vineyard site, the way we train the vines and the way we cut the leaves back and we do all this is that the vines are getting the sun in the morning when it's not as intense. And then as it comes over and goes to the back side of the vines, we have much more green on that side. The canopy is protecting the grapes. So we're getting to burn off those pyrazines when the sun isn't so intense and then when the sun is intense, we're getting dappled sunlight, <laughs> you know, in the back. So we're still getting to burn off the pyrazines, but we're not concerning ourselves with that intense sun that we can have. And then, as I said earlier, right, the temperatures cool down at night and the grapes get to go to sleep a little bit and they get to kind of rejuvenate themselves and go back at it the next day. Well, I always think of it as a, like a workout. You know, you work out, you work hard, and then you've got to rest because that's when muscles build up. Not that that's the right metaphor, but you've got to rest to actually work out again. Anyway, that's what's happening for the grapes. So now you chose the white grape of the Loire Valley, Chenin Blanc, as one of your flagship wines as well. Why did you go with that one? Oh, there we go. You're showing the bottle. This is our Chenin Blanc. And this actually is the only wine we make because we also make a rosé. But this is the only wine we make that does not come from Paso. And that is because of the temperature in Paso. Again, Chenin also likes silt soils, and we have calcareous soils. What does calcareous mean? Is it chalky or what is it's it? It's chalk. So the ocean, right? It came in. We had the ocean. We've got all of those fossils of ocean life, all of those bones that are in there, that chalkiness that's in there. 
And it's similar to silt, similar kind of, but it's different. And we go where the grapes are the best. So for our palate, <laughs> very distinctive, our palate, Paso is too hot for Shannon. So we went to Clarksburg for that. Where is that in relation? Yeah. Uh, north. And it's close to Sacramento, closer to the Lodi wine growing region than to Paso. So that's where we get our fruit for the Chenin. And we chose Chenin Blanc because of its relationship to Cab Franc, the Loire Valley. Right. That totally makes sense. And you, you've described yourself as an acid head. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I love that. I'm an acid head too, by the way. So, But I want to know what you mean by it. Oh, that's one of the reasons why I love Albarino so much also. Wines have acidity to them. Even red wines have acidity to them, but those tannins kind of calm it down a bit. You don't get so much of it. But in a white wine, when the acid is high, it's salivating. You know, you take a sip of the wine and your tongue just starts to salivate, kind of like if you suck on a lemon, you know, right? That acid, it salivates. And what it does is it makes you just crave another drink, it just makes you crave another sip of that wine. And I love a high acid wine in balance, but I love a high acid wine. Shannon is a high acid wine. <laughs> Absolutely. And just as you squeeze lemon on a fish or whatever, because it adds that mouthwatering acidity and makes the food taste better, I think the acidity also brings forward the flavor in the wine and makes it even taste better. Absolutely. Acid is our friend. <laughs> yes. There's a balance. You need to have a balance, but yes. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. The time has flown. I'm going to ask you some quick questions, Lori, before we wrap up, because I just love these stories. Can you tell us about a favorite childhood food? I don't know if you how long you've been a vegetarian, but was there a favorite food you used to eat as a child and what would you pair with it now? My favorite food as a child, and it has probably more to do with the story of it, is ravioli. Oh. And that's because my great-grandmother, I have memories of me being table high, like my arms were like this to reach on top of the table, but my great-grandmother making ravioli with me. And that is my favorite childhood memory, making raviolis with uh, homemade raviolis with great-grandma. And, oh, God, they can pair with so much um, a Barolo, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, they're pretty neutral. I mean, they're flavorful, but they're very versatile. Yeah. And again, mine would only be cheese in there. So <laughs> mm, there <laughs> um, you go. Yeah, a Barolo or uh, depending if you add, depending on what the sauce was, you know, you could change up what the wine is depending on what you're putting in that sauce, how hot the sauce is, or it's just plain marinara sauce. Sure. Mm, sounds good. What's the weirdest wine pairing you've ever had? Probably shouldn't keep asking wine pairing questions, but anyway, if you can recall anything. You know what? Anything with asparagus. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Anything with asparagus. asparagus. Asparagus is really a tough one to pair. Yeah. Because it has that cinnamon or cinnamon that makes everything taste sweet. Yeah. It's just an odd, it's an odd thing. And you know what else I find is very interesting and odd pairing? Everybody's like wine and chocolate. And that is a very difficult pairing to that do. That is hard. You need some help when you're pairing wine and chocolate. And even dairy content wrecks havoc. But so back to asparagus, would the Shannon work or what would you pair with asparagus? It does work with the Shannon. It's not what I would say is the best pairing for Shannon, but it does work with the Shannon. I don't eat this, but our club member sent me so many text messages of scallops with the Shannon. I've never received so many messages about scallops in my life. But when we first released it and the club members got it, people were sending us messages of, oh my God, this is so good. And everything was a scallop. Like, okay, a lot of people like scallops. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you have it or can describe it, but the auger spinner? Oh. What is that? Because we like to figure out wine gadgets on this podcast, but I was listening to you talk about it somewhere else. So maybe you can tell me what it is. It's an air rate as it, you what know. What is auger? Auger is, as a microbiologist, it's food for microorganisms. So there's like potato dextrose or, you know, so you're taking this food and you're putting it in a Petri dish and then the microorganisms... If there's microorganisms in the food, you swipe it and the microorganisms will grow because they're eating the food. They're eating what's in the, in the Petri dish, right? Okay. Okay. So when you're making the auger, it's a magnet and it spins and then you put this auger spinner in it and it spins. 
you know, it's a vortex. It makes a vortex. So when I saw this gadget, I was like, oh, that's an auger spinner. That's pretty clever. So I sent an email. I said, is this an auger spinner? And he was like, yeah, kind of. Blah, blah, blah. So he sent me one to try out. And it's cool. You, you put any decanter you want on this spinner, and then you put the metal spinner in it. You turn it on for a certain amount of time. And what it does is it creates a vortex. So it does exactly the same thing as if you're doing this to your... Okay, spinning it by the right. neck. So yeah, we swirl, we swirl it. our yeah. right. We swirl our glasses to release those aromatics and things like that. Or you take the decanter and you do this if you want to speed it up a bit. You're just putting micro oxygenation into it, but it does it through a metal spinner, and so that's it. I love it. You know, it really does decant a lot faster because you're putting air into it. And you called it a D spinner, like D is in dog. V. Oh, V spinner, as in Victor. Yes. Bee spinner. Interesting. Yeah. And now I've seen, he was the first one who came out with this product. And now I see that there's other variations on it. Other people have taken his, I guess he came off a patent and now people are doing it. It's copycats. Did you say someone wants to put wine in a blender? Oh yeah. No, yeah. I mean, that's kind of like you see it on TV or you see it something. You can take stunts. wine. Yeah. You can take wine and you can put it in blender and you spin it and all you're still only adding oxygen to it, but a blender is, I don't recommend a blender. That's, that's really kind of rough on the wine. It's rough. Can wine actually bruise? I think it's just over oxidizing it. Oh, okay. I think you're okay. going to miss that point of good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I'm just, I'm a geek when it comes to gadgets. So I was just curious. This isn't a gadget, but one of my favorite wine stories was in Napa. We were tasting Zinfandel and I tasted it and I said to the man who was working in the field when we pulled up, so doing whatever he's doing in the field. And we pulled up, walked into his bar and he starts pouring us wine. And I tasted the Zin. I'm like, oh, this will be good down the road, but it's pretty tight right now. So he takes the glass out of my hand, takes his other hand, puts it over the glass, shakes it, and then hands it back to me and says, I, it just aged five years. Oh, well, his hand was all over the wine. <laughs> Pre-COVID, I assume. Very, very, very <laughs> pre-COVID. But that was actually my first lesson in aeration because we were really young in the wine. You know, that was like our second trip, first trip to Napa. So very young in our wine world. And that was my first learning of aeration. I might try that or not <laughs> tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's your hand. Yeah, exactly. so. <laughs> but do it. It's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. To do it before and after would be interesting to taste the wine first and then do it and then see, okay, what does it taste like now? Interesting. Do it over a sink just in case. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, I'm not going to take any chances for sure. Maybe even in the shower. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Lori, this has been wonderful. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to mention now? No, just people can find me on social media under both Exploring the Wine Glass is where I do things wine-oriented that are not Dracaena wines. And then the other is at Dracaena Wines all over the place. We did just get our score for our latest vintage and it is a 90. So Congrats. we are still 90 plus on every vintage. So we're pretty excited about that. And I I think I mentioned that we did do a rosé also. Yes, that's right. And drink more Cab Frog. All right, <laughs> we will. We will. Hashtag Cab Frog. So your your website is dracinawines.com? Correct. The website is dracinawines.com. And there is a website exploring the wine glass, but that does link you back to Dracina Wines. Dracina. Okay. We'll put those in the show notes for sure. That's so where people the, have the links. blog is and the podcast and I do want to mention I do a monthly podcast episode called Wine Fabet Street. I take the letter, the next letter of the alphabet each month, and we explore a grape variety. And this Monday, if you go to winefabetstreet.com, this Monday we are talking to Christina Netzel. I'm going to have to make sure I'm saying her name correctly in Austria because we are learning about Zweigelt. Oh, that's a zesty red wine. Cool climate red. Good for acid heads, I would imagine. <laughs> so that's a monthly thing. So that's another thing that I do. Awesome. Well, definitely lots of resources and ways to find you online, Lori. And again, we'll put it all in the show notes. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you on your podcast soon. Yes, I am very excited to have you as a guest. And thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you officially. 
Absolutely. It is a pleasure. And like I said, it's like, I follow you. So it was wonderful <laughs> to be talking with you. Oh, great. Well, I follow you too, Lori. I think you're doing a great job with your podcast and all the other initiatives, including Cab Franc Day. So keep up the good work and I'll say bye for now, but I'm looking forward to chatting with you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lori. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed part two of our chat with Lori. Here are my takeaways. I'm so glad Lori highlighted Cabernet Franc as it's such an undervalued but terrific wine. We all need to show it a little more respect. Two, I'm looking forward to visiting California's Paso Robles region after listening to Lori describe the wines, the land, and the people. And three, I've always considered myself an acid head when it comes to wine. Acidity is what gives wine its vibrancy and life. It also makes it so much more food friendly. In the show notes, you'll find my email contact, the full transcript to my conversation with Lori, links to her podcast and website, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you'll find the live stream video version of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 182. If you have a sip, tip, question, or want to be a beta reader of my new memoir, email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. You won't want to miss next week when we chat with Stevie Kim, the managing director of Vinitaly International, the world's largest wine trade show, as well as the host of the Italian Wine Podcast. In the meantime, if you missed episode 23, go back and take a listen. I chat with Randall Graham about California wines and his blend of wit and wisdom. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. The name Rome Ranger has been very catchy and it's been helpful to my cause. The issue I have though is that we in California ultimately somehow need to get out of the shadow of our European colleagues and somehow learn how to redefine ourselves on our own terms rather than as something derivative or something referential to something else. Who wants to be the second best? Do you want to be your own thing? I think we in the new world have to get there somehow. I'm working on it. And I think the way to get there for me personally is try to figure out what can we do in the new world that can't be done in the old world that's interesting and wonderful and pleasurable. But let's do it and find the grapes that are uniquely suited to our sites rather than take something else and try to make Burgundian-style Pinot Noir or Cote Rotie-like Syrah or Barolo-ish Nebbiolo, for example. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the wines and stories we discussed. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a juicy Cabernet Franc. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Thank you.